everybody, this is Maximilian, and my god, that intro was weird. Let's never do that again. So, early this morning, on a Saturday, I know, at 9.30, I took a final. I know, it was a preposterous injustice. Hopefully it will never, ever be committed again, but it's over, and the exam was stupendously easy, so I really don't care. That end, I was reversing my sleep schedule, so to speak, um, actually, to yesterday. Yesterday, I pulled a long day. I went to bed really early, and by really early, I mean it like... 5.30, <laughs> so really freaking early. So I basically started my day at 3 a.m. this morning, which is really weird because, like, when you wake up, you know how you, you feel hungry. You, you want to have breakfast because your body's like, okay, time to start the day. Let's put something in me. And then you come to the realization that you have no food in your dorm and nothing on campus is open. Oh, it sucks. So I starved myself for a good five hours while I waited for McDonald's to open. Well, actually, it wasn't five hours. It was more like four. It opened at seven, but still. I mean, like, when you have to try and bode your time, or bide your time, whatever. Wrong word. When you have to uh, pass the time with water and gum, it gets to be a, gets to be a bit uh, stressful after a while. Because, like, gum is, like, it's very interesting. Like, after a meal, when you're satisfied, it's great because, like, you, you feel like your mouth is filthy. You need to clean it out and get all that gunk and really bad food smell out of your mouth that you just ate. But, like, when you're hungry and you're trying to use gum to, like, satisfy yourself, it's, oh, it's terrible. Because not only does it dehydrate you, which really sucks when you're on an empty stomach, getting dehydrated from gum, and it also makes you hungrier because it stimulates your appetite... So you might as well be, like, trying to move an ocean with a spoon. It's just not helpful at all. So I somehow managed to get through in that four hours of agony. I know you can hardly call that agony, but whatever. It felt like agony to me at the time, guys. Come on. Show me a little bit of sympathy here, or empathy in my case, if you've ever had to reset your sleep schedule and you start your day at 3 in the morning. So I bowed my, I, I, ah, there it is again. God, why am I so retarded today? That exam wasn't even that hard. I shouldn't be, like, brain dead or anything. But basically, I ended up uh, making it through by watching a couple episodes of Top Gear. That show literally saves my life whenever I least expect it. Like, when you're bored and you have nothing to do, or you just need to, like, pass a couple of hours, just watch some Top Gear. Go find a website and stream, or stream it on Netflix, or just whatever. It, there's literally no better way to pass the time. There's just something about British humor that I find very entertaining. I, I guess it's kind of a niche thing. Some people don't really care at all for it. Some people love it. But Top Gear is just awesome because, well, I love cars, and that's probably the first step to liking Top Gear is to actually enjoy people talking about cars for an hour. And on top of that, they're also really funny. You've got to love the humor that Jeremy Clarkson brings to the stage as well, this side cast of uh, Rich Hammond and uh, James May. And they get to drive some really exotic cars that you'd otherwise never see in real life. Cars that would cost well over six figures that you would never have any hope of laying your eyes on, much less your own two hands on the steering wheel. So it's always nice, because it's it's kind of like living a fantasy, living a dream. You have to live it through them, but hey, whatever. I mean, how often are you going to see a guy who gets to take an Audi R8 or a Ferrari 458 around a test track? It's... Awesome. Like, the, sh the show is awesome. And they do all kinds of stupid stuff on there, too. Like, they'll do double-decker racing, where they literally pop two cars on top of the other and extend the steering column to the second car, so that way the person on the top has to steer, but the person on the bottom has to work the gas and brake. Oh, yeah, that stuff. That's interesting. It's a, it's just a great show. So if you haven't seen Top Gear before, go ahead and see Top Gear. I'm giving a shout-out to Top Gear. Links in the description. Nah, just kidding. There's no link in the description. Just Google it. There's literally dozens of websites that'll let you watch Top Gear. Or if you have Netflix, you can literally just pop it in your instant queue. They have like four or five series just ready to go. So, now that I've given my little Top Gear bit, I'll have to give myself a little Twitter plug here. Follow me on Twitter if you haven't before. If you don't use Twitter, that's okay. Awesome. That only took, what, like two seconds? Last time I probably spent like a whole two minutes on that, and I apologize. I'm just trying to build up my little Twitter following so I can interact with you guys. It's great for me, great for you, and the story. We'll keep it short. This episode really isn't much more of anything than fighting Pokemon battles and moving a little farther ahead. There is actually a critical item later in this episode. You're going into, I guess, what's called a... I think it's called, like, the, the National Park or something, or maybe it's just, like, a regular park. I have no idea. It's not the Safari Zone, though. There's not really too much interesting there. The Safari Zone is actually not in Generation 2 games. They have what's called, like, the Safari Zone Beta, like, um... 
it exists, so to speak, in the story, but it's closed, so you can't go in there. That's because um, they were working on it, but they didn't actually fully develop it by the time they were planning on releasing the game, so they didn't include it. You can get to it by means of a glitch, I believe. However, uh, the, the uh, Safari Zone itself is incredibly unstable, and I really don't want to take the chance of corrupting my save data, so I'm not going to bother with that. But if you want to read up more on it, you can always find articles about it. They did bring it back in Generation 3, though. So if you're missing your Safari Zone, just go play uh, Ruby and Sapphire. Or just go back to Red and Blue, because Red and Blue are better. Red and Blue is awesome. I'm like a Red and Blue fanboy. Either that or I'm just slightly biased towards nostalgia, but that's just me. I actually, I don't think I have played Ruby or Sapphire. Maybe I have, like, on an emulator once. But if I did, I don't really remember my experience with it. So I don't have much experience with the third generation and on. Like, fourth gen is... Yeah, never even touched 4th Gen, because that was Nintendo DS, and I never really played much anything for Nintendo DS, because I ended up giving it to my sister, to just because she, she played it a lot more than I did, so I figured I might as well give it to her. And then she ended up losing it, so, well, it was gone forever. Even when I did want to play it, I couldn't find it anymore. So, yeah, my DS experience was a short one, to say the least. But, right now, I've got one exam left, and it's on Monday, so... I think I'm probably going to be studying, well, at least maybe all evening Saturday. Like, it really isn't that bad of an exam, but I do need to do somewhat well on it because the midterm for that class did not go so well. And the only things we're graded on are these two exams, so uh, it would behoove me to actually do well on it. So I may take a break from uh, posting up a video over the next two days or so. I'll try and get one out Monday night. I can't guarantee it because the exam is a, a three-hour exam, and it starts at, like, 4.30. So, uh, at the very earliest, I'll be getting out of there by 7.30 because I don't think they let you out of an exam early. They have, um, it depends on the prof and the class. Some exams are like, they'll let you out when you're done. Other times they'll make you sit there with nothing to do. Like, you can't turn on your iPod or anything because, you know, the, the fear of cheating is just ubiquitous among university professors. So... Hopefully, I don't have to sit there for another hour and a half because I guarantee it's not going to take me an hour and a half. Even if I don't know the actual, like, uh, the material that I should know for the exam, like, if I'm stuck on a question, I'm not going to sit there for an hour and a half trying to contemplate the answer to it because I'm pretty sure it's all multiple choice. So even if I don't know the answer to a question, I'll just pick one eventually. It's not going to take me that long, so I sincerely hope that he lets me out early if I finish it because that would suck to sit in a lecture hall for three hours straight with nothing to do. Exams are the worst. It's one thing you find out when you get to college. Not only are final exams really annoying in the fact that you have to sit in a room for two hours and do nothing but write and think, but all the stress that is involved in actually leading up to them and studying for them is just absolutely horrible. That's also a part of what contributes to the infamous Freshman 15. Um, you've probably heard of it. If you haven't, though, when you go to college, there's, um, there's a tradition called the Freshman 15. Basically, the onset of various added stresses from things like classes, time management, poor sleep schedule, not to mention college food, is notoriously unhealthy for you. On top of the fact that you're sort of finishing your, um, your biological development and stage in life, like you're, you're officially ending puberty, I guess, sometimes. Sometimes if you're a late developer, it goes even longer into that. But basically, your body just sets itself up for a giant weight gain with all these taken in. So the freshman 15 is the infamous 15 pounds that you gain over the course of your freshman year. Although, you also, with that added stress and time management issues, will tend to not exercise nearly as much as you used to unless you're like basically required to for like sports activities, like if you're on scholarship for a sport at your university or something like that. I generally found out the case that I was spending a lot more time with uh, school and socializing in general than I was actually, you know, doing active things than I was in high school, because high school was a breeze. Like, you had all the free time in the world. It's not so in college. So on top of eating really crappy food, getting stressed out for exams, not sleeping, you're also exercising a lot less. So in all reality, it ends up being a little bit more than freshman 15. Like, if you can get away with only gaining 15 pounds your first year in college, then you're doing pretty okay. And if you don't gain any weight, then you are like a mastermind of time management or you just have the metabolism of a gazelle. That's all I'm going to say. I think it ended up being like 20 pounds for me. So right now I'm kind of in the process of trying to fix my eating habits because when you eat college food for two years straight 
and I have to tell you, it is it is not easy to eat healthy at college. No matter how much variety it seems they're offering you, there the food really is not good for you at all. Uh, basically, you have to either go out and buy your own groceries and cook your own food, or you have to just eat a lot less. There's really no other way to control uh, the massive amount of weight that you're going to start gaining at college. Or you could just exercise more of that too, although it's kind of hard to find time in the day to actually do it. But I find the best way, at least for me, anyway, since I'm living in a house slash apartment by myself, I don't need a university meal plan, which is really the first step to actually getting, excuse me, which is really the first step to getting out of that vicious cycle of gaining weight by eating crappy food. I buy my own groceries, so I'm trying to change my eating habits a little bit by actually forcibly making myself to buy groceries that are better for me, so I, that way I end up eating them. Because it sucks to actually pay for something and then not use it, because you're essentially just burning money at that point. So I'm trying to fix my eating habits as well as my grocery habits. And I'm also trying to uh, deliberately exercise a bit more. Because when you start carrying on like added weight from college in your life, you carry those habits into your adult life, and then things just get really bad from there. You start the downhill spiral, and before you know it, you've got the beer belly by the time you're 30. So I'm going to try to avoid that if at all possible. Oh, really, honestly, the easiest thing you can do is just exercise more often. Even if you still ate the crappy college food all day, every day, just exercising enough to offset it or even burn a little bit would keep you in check. Because you're young at this point in life, so your metabolism should be okay. And there are some people who, like, love running or play soccer and things like that. People who have naturally built up their metabolism in their youth actually have a nice advantage over this. So they really don't have to do much. But uh, I am not so fortunate to have such a metabolism. I wasn't too much of an athlete or not as much of an athlete as other people I knew when I was younger. And whenever I did do athletics, it was usually for sports like um, baseball. Like, I was really big into baseball when I was young, and baseball isn't exactly the um, the greatest sport for being in shape. Like, if you look at most people who play professional baseball today, most of them look um, at least somewhat overweight. It's kind of it's kind of like golf. Baseball and golf are, like, my two big sports that I'm actually good at, and those are, like, the only two sports where you don't actually have to be in great physical shape to play well. Now, granted, actually, the people in the major leagues do have to exercise quite regularly and are in much better shape than they appear. Um... Uh, they just look a bit bigger because they don't have to be nearly as toned down because there's not a whole lot of movement involved in baseball or golf for that matter either. Golf requires absolutely no physical fitness at all, at least in my opinion. It's basically all coordination, so physical strength is not a factor. Basically, by the natural weight of your body, you generate momentum on your golf swing, so that way you'll end up hitting the ball farther. Although I guess that means that if you're fatter then you hit the ball farther, so wouldn't it make sense if everybody who played golf were like 400 pounds? Hmm, something to think about. I don't know, maybe you should try it. <laughs> no, don't, don't, don't be that. Don't gain 400 pounds. It's not worth it even if you hit the ball 50 yards farther on your tee shot in golf. Not worth it at all. So yeah, that was my little aside on getting healthy with Maximilian. Gosh, first I'm a psychologist, then I offer advice in like university life. And now I'm your nutritionist. I'm slowly taking over every little doctor role in your life. Before you know it, I'm going to be a pediatrician and I'll be prescribing you things over YouTube. <laughs> Good thing I don't live in Canada, right? <laughs> All right. So let's get back to Pokemon. Let's get on something relevant. Um, I believe the next city is where, um, spoiler alert, we actually encounter the three legendary beasts, so to speak, Entei, Suicune, and Raikou. And you kind of, I guess, set them free or whatever. They start roaming around, bonking around all over the place. Eventually, we'll run it. We'll probably run into one eventually, just by some happenstance. But I think every time you fly or enter a building, it's one of those two events. Either every time you fly to a city or enter a building, their location changes. So they're really hard to keep track of unless you absolutely want to be super diligent about it and just walk everywhere. Which gets really annoying after a while, but after we release them, I'll try and find one for you. Just so I can kind of show you, you know, maybe how you would encounter them. Although at this point, since we don't have Master Balls, they're basically impossible to catch. But with the Quick Claw you just got from that woman sitting on the bench in the park, you actually have the ability to have the Pokemon that's holding it to strike first. So if you have, say, like a Ghastly, for instance, who knows Hypnosis, you have a chance of at least slowing them down a little bit. 
Plus, the fastballs you get from Kurt that he makes from the white apricorns will also give you a better chance of catching them. So I'll give that a shot if I can. That is assuming I actually run into them as well. But that is the end of this episode. Stay tuned for the next one. I'll be done for good in about two days. So look me in then. See you later.